sweet spirit of God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your words are ever true. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. We don't take for granted your presence in this place. Come speak to us. Reveal yourself to us through your word. May our lives never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats in the presence of God. This morning we are going to listen to another Christmas sermon. If you are 30 years old, it means that at least you've heard about 25 Christmas sermons, different, different, different sermons in different forms and shapes. But this morning we are going to put an emphasis still on the birth of Christ, so the essence of Christmas. Why Christmas? Why do people celebrate it? You know, but I'll say a few things before I start the sermon. Jesus Christ was not born on 25th December. Hallelujah. So it's just um, a day chosen to commemorate his birth, not necessarily the fact that today is Jesus' birthday. Please, let's get that right. Hallelujah. Then we'll go ahead and then see why the early church fathers saw the wisdom in instituting a day like this. Number one is because we human beings, we easily forget. Yes, even people we love, we easily forget them. And, and, and no matter how amazing things are, if we don't find a way of reminding yourself of it, you realize that it fades into history. Newer things come up every day. And then old and important things fade into history. So Jesus Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper. And for that, he said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of him. Don't forget. It means that you are likely going to forget this important thing. But don't, 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 even, don't even think of forgetting it. Why? It forms the basis of your belief system. If you forget something like this, you forget why you were saved in the first place. So, although Jesus Christ did not ask us to commemorate or remember his birth, the early church fathers saw the wisdom in, you know, putting a remembrance to us that there was a time he was born, his life, and then his death. Hallelujah. So, that's why we are, we celebrate Christmas. Not the food, not the visitation, not the gifts, not the decorations, but the wisdom behind remembering his birth. Hallelujah. And this morning, I'm going to look at the four Gospels because there are four different accounts um, of, of the birth of Jesus and all of them for um, different perspectives, but they are all telling the same story. Hallelujah. Their emphasis on the story is different, but the goal is one. Hallelujah. And you ask why God will tell the same story in four different ways. Hallelujah. So we start with Mark. The book of Mark made no mention of the birth of Jesus. We just see him at his baptism. And the book of Mark was the first book that was written, the first gospel that was written after the death of Christ. Remember, the letters of Paul were written before the gospels were written. Although the life of Jesus happened before, because it was many years after the death and ascension of Jesus Christ that the gospels were written. So Paul started writing his letters to the churches before even the Gospels were documented. So a lot of premium is put on the letters of Paul. I don't know whether you are getting me because it was written about 75 years after. You can imagine 75, your short life, 30 years, is such a long time. So you can imagine 70, when you are an old man, something that happened when you were a baby, you are trying to account right perfectly what it is. You can imagine how vague if God was not leading them to write. I don't know whether you are getting me. The account, the precision, the agreement with the other writers. They did not sit in a room to write. Though. They wrote at different times. Some of them 100 years afterwards. So when someone writes a letter 100 years from now, someone writes a letter in another city, 75 years. Someone writes another letter 80 years. And they all agree, telling the same story. It shows you that God was in it. So Mark didn't even mention anything about the birth of Jesus. We only saw that, you know, it started with John the Baptist in the Judea desert and preaching, you know, pre you know, prepare, you know, the way for the Lord and all the message we see. But why is that important? It was because the book of Mark was written to the Romans, to the Romans. And the Roman society at the time 
was a society that had social divisions. So we had the upper echelon, we had the lower class, we have the middle class. They were divided into different, different classes. And they were a society that believed in slavery and servanthood and master. So the master had a position in society. The servant had a, so, uh, what was it, a role, you know. So there were divisions in the society. And then Jesus Christ, who was being described to this society, came as a matured man. I don't know whether you are getting me. And it was not important how he was born and where he was born. Whether he was born in a palace, a manger, whether he was born in a five-star hotel or a five-star hospital with a niku or whatever. It, it didn't matter. The fact was that he came as a servant. I don't know whether you are getting me. So Mark in his account did not mention his birth because irrespective of the noble birth of a servant, a servant is a servant, although he is a master. So he is trying to portray servant leadership to a society that believes in the richest should be at the top and the poorest should be at the bottom. But here we see the Lord of all serving. So the emphasis of the book of Mark was to portray Jesus as a slave of God, as a servant of God, although he is God himself. So he made no mentions of the birth of, of Jesus Christ or his childhood and all the events that happened. So that the Roman society will understand that irrespective of your birth, irrespective of your social class, your family, your lineage, you have a place in the kingdom. Hallelujah. So that, that, that was the emphasis of the book of Mark. And although the book was attributed to Mark and Mark wrote it, it was actually the teachings of Peter. Hey, hallelujah. The teachings of Peter, the accounts of Peter that was documented by Mark. So that's where I start my submission from. The Christmas story from Mark because there was no story at all. There was nothing to tell from the perspective of Mark. Then the next one that was written was Matthew. The book of Matthew was written to the Jews. And the Jews, they believe in their father, Abraham. So if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, he says that the book of the genealogy of Christ. So he is trying to trace the lineage of Christ in Judaism. That he is linked to you. He is one of you. So in writing to this congregation who were Jews, he said, the book of the genealogy of Christ, the son of David, the Jews knew David. David is the king, like he is the king who represents and mirrors the dimensions of God on earth. So when you mention David, that this guy is linked to David, it is trying to communicate something. But it did not end there. He says, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Why is he mentioning Abraham? Because Abraham started Judaism. He was the one that God called out. And said, go to the land that I will show you. And through Abraham, we have Isaac. Through Isaac, we have what? Jacob. And through Jacob, we have the 12 tribes. So he's trying to link Jesus to Judaism. That, listen, the man I'm coming to talk to you about is not a stranger. And basically, one of the wisdom keys that would help you in 2024, the year to come, is the wisdom of zookeeping. I've mentioned it here before, the wisdom of zookeeping. In the zoo, the snake is not treated the same way as the lion. The ant is not treated the same way as the antelope. They are not fed the same food. Equality doesn't work in the zoo or in the jungle. You cannot feed the lion the meal you are feeding an ant because you want to be equal. You cannot treat all people the same. You respect all people, you love all people, but the way you relate to people are different. So when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You, you think it was written to Christians. You have to know the audience and why the emphasis was made. Like the things that the book talks about, the miracles, the things. It is to a particular group so that they could relate to what was being written. I don't know whether you are getting me. So when it comes to Matthew, the genealogy of Christ was important. How he came from Abraham all the way to David and how he fulfilled scripture. So 700 years before common era, which was the era in which Jesus was born. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that the virgin would be with a child. And then the Matthew was trying to write to his Jewish audience that Jesus Christ and his birth was a fulfillment of a 700-year-old prophecy. It tells you that God is faithful to all generations. It means that for the first 100 years, Isaiah looked like a liar. It looked like the word of God won't come to pass. Some of you in your 20 years of life, you feel God has failed you. 
You feel a prophetic word hasn't come to pass because there are challenges. It took 700 years before common era for a prophetic word that prophet Isaiah, who was one of the most accurate prophets of the Old Testament, gave to, to see fruition. In his own life, it did not happen. Even in the life of his grandchildren, it did not happen. And those who heard him may have thought that he lied. Those who have heard the prophecies that went about the Christ may feel like God did not keep his word. Your life is too short to doubt the faithfulness of God. You are not yet 40 years. You are not yet 50 years. And already you have given up on God. You've lived 22 years. And already you want to walk away from God because he has not kept a word. He says that none of these words would fall to the ground. It took 700 years, but Matthew said that a virgin would be with a child. And he was quoting prophet Isaiah. And the Jews understood it because they chronicled the prophets. They wrote about them. The scribes wrote about their prophecies. And he says that among you is a prophetic word made manifest. In this season of Christmas, it's a season of prophetic words seeing daylight. I pray for you that any prophetic word that has gone before you, a prophetic word that went before your, your, your grandparents and your great-grandchildren, uh, your great-grandparents, in this generation will see daylight. You didn't hear what I'm saying. I'm saying that there was a prophecy in the 80s, a prophecy in the 70s, a prophecy in the 50s concerning something in your family. I pray that you'll be the receiving end of the, that prophetic word in the name of Jesus. Yes, yeah, so Matthew's emphasis was on the lineage of Jesus Christ and his attachments to Abraham, to David, and how it came all the way to Joseph and Mary and how he's coming to fulfill prophecies. So the season of Christmas is a season of the manifestation of prophecies. I pray that prophetic words that are hanging in the atmospheres would become flesh in your life in the name of Jesus. Then the next book that was written was Luke. The book of Luke was written to a Gentile population. It was written not to the Jews who were considered to be believers at the time. It was written to the Gentiles. So the pre pre preoccupation of a book like this was to deal with the issues that happened in the society, segregation, women, children. So you realize that the book of Luke put so much emphasis on Mary and Elizabeth who, uh, who saw angels. In their time, in, 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 you, you don't see women being booked in anything. They were not considered to be much. So here you have Luke, who was written to a Gentile population and was putting emphasis on children, was putting emphasis on women, was putting emphasis on the rich, the poor. He was dealing with issues that society was facing. But you see, when you see the, the Jews or Israel, they had the laws of God that was governing them. So to an extent, women were somehow protected. Children were protected. When you see the laws of Moses, there was provision made for women to be protected and all those things. But for the Gentile population, they were practicing like the Rome and those other places. They were practicing very crude things against women. So here you are, women are seeing angels, women are having encounters, prophetic words are coming to pass. You know, a virgin is with child. And the, the beauty about this is the fact that, listen, Christmas is a season of wonder, where wonderful things happen, where the impossible becomes possible, where a virgin who has never been with a man is pregnant with a child, where a woman, an old woman, a grandmother who is postmenopausal is pregnant with a child. I pray for you that this, in this season of Christmas, something that is considered impossible becomes possible in your life in the name of Jesus. What was impossible before? What science cannot explain? Till now, science is not able to explain what happened with Mary. It's not able to explain what happened with Elizabeth. Something that science cannot explain, physical laws cannot explain, may it happen practically in your life in the name of Jesus. May an impossibility become a possibility in the name of Jesus. And in the same time, the season of Christmas is a season of miracles. It's a season of the supernatural. It's a season where angels are visiting earth, when the realms are open. So I pray for you that you will not eat and forget about the fact that encounters are happening in this season of Christmas. That angels are appearing. Angels are singing. There are visitations from above. The voice of God is sounding in the heavens. So you will not make a mistake and jam and go for parties and listen to music and eat rice and eat jollof and fellowship with family without having any of that encounter. I pray for you that you 
participate in the miraculous, in the supernatural, and the angelic visitation, and heaven kissing earth in this season. That in this next few days, it will not only be about the gifts. It will not be about the music. It will not be about the new clothes and, and the time with family and friends. It will also be time with God because that was the time that the, the angelic visitations and, 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 and heaven's invasion of earth was at its peak through human history in the season of Christmas. We are reminding ourselves that about 2,000 years ago or more than 2,000 years ago, heaven invaded earth. There was an invasion. That is the whole point. That heaven can do it again. Oh, you didn't hear what I'm saying. That heaven invaded it. Where the divine saw the flesh and tabernacled in the womb of Mary. And we see angels jubilating. Common shepherds saw angels. And people saw stars. They were miraculous things. They were not prophets. They were not scribes. They were not Sadducees. They were not the ordinary woman like Mary. And you see... It was Elizabeth's husband who was the priest. But an angel appeared to a housewife. You don't get what I'm saying. That ordinary people can have supernatural encounters. And ordinary people can encounter angels. You know, when, when, when Gabriel appeared before Elizabeth, he said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I pray for you that in this season, you would encounter something divine. You would interface a, a dimension of God, a mirrored image of God. You would see angels you would have visitation your life would never be the same an ordinary teenager Mary saw an angel in a season and her life changed forever I pray for you that you look out for visitations oh you didn't hear me I pray that you watch out for them you would watch out for them because if God could do it then he is able to do it now so the book of Luke put so much emphasis on ordinary women. When I say ordinary women, they, were, they had no social standing who started having visitations from God. They say, you the Gentiles understand this principle. It is not about him that ran it. It is the Lord that showeth mercy. That God has chosen the weak things of the earth to confound the wise. It is not about the wisdom of this world. It's not about the princes of this world. It is about the wisdom of God. It's about God uniting all people. So Luke put emphasis on women, on children, on the weak things, on the beggarly things, on, on the manger. He put emphasis on they not finding place in the hotel or in the inn and they have to go into where the sheep lay. He was putting emphasis on the weak things that can be strong. I don't know the weakness that exists in your life but today the spotlight is put on it that God can use the weak and beggarly things to fulfill his agenda. God can use a manger to fulfill his agenda. God can use the weak and beggarly people you know of this earth to to fulfill his agenda that was the emphasis of luke and he wrote this letter to a gentile population a gentile population who would be fascinated by the miracles you know because for for an unbeliever the miracles are important if the dead are raised, the unbelievers are able to understand that something supernatural is happening. So that's why when you read the book of Luke, the miracles of Jesus are their peak. It's not just because he was a doctor or he was a physician, but also for the, this Gentile population, they know a man who was born blind. Uh, when they are healed, it's not ordinary. It's not chance. They know that God is able to work miracles. And we are this Gentile population that this letter was being written to. I pray that we experience the miraculous, the miracle working power of God, the, the, the presence of God. So look, put emphasis in God invading earth. People who, who didn't seem to be counted in anything, experiencing God like never before. And I pray that that will be your testimony in the name of Jesus. Then we talk about Apostle John, the beloved of God, the one who said he was the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, it was not that Jesus had favorites, but John knew that he was loved. It makes a difference. Some of you are loved and don't know it. Ah, Jesus loved all of them equally, but John personalized it. He saw the love. He, he said, no, you know, he himself wrote that I am the one, I'm the disciple that. It was not Matthew who wrote that. Too. You, you don't see it written anywhere else. The disciple Jesus life from today. You want to say sex, the disciple that Jesus. You have to personalize it. Nobody is going to say sex. You know, God loves you more than. No, 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 no. You have to say God loves you more than everyone. 
It was Paul himself who said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you. I don't know whether you are getting All of you are speaking in tongues more than you. It was John who said, I am the disciple that Jesus loves. No, among the three, I am the one. You have to get to the place where you see the love of God. No matter the adversity. It was this same uh, John that was fried in hot oil and he escaped and hurt. It was not because he did not go through any challenges or any, any hardships or any, any persecution. He went through all of that. But he still saw the love of God. And he could conclude that I am the disciple that Jesus loves. Can, can, you, can you hit your chest? And said, despite the challenges, the hurts, the disappointments, I am the disciple that Jesus loves. I am the dis- I want you to say it to yourself. I am the disciple. I am the disciple that Jesus loves. Above everyone, he loves me more. He loves me more. And, and because he knew what he had, he was the one that God showed himself to. He was the revelator. He wrote the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. But the Christmas story was captured by John in a special way because John wrote to the Greeks. You don't get what I'm saying. He wrote to the Greeks. And the Greeks, they like philosophy. They like Zeus. They they like what are some of their gods? Apollos. They, 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 they like this little God, Stadios, and, and the, the God of thunder, the God of light, the God of this, and they loved a lot of philosophy. So John, in writing to this population of people, had to now start his letter, not by the virgin bed, but in the beginning. Ah, hallelujah. In the beginning, in the beginning, before Zeus and before Apollos and before Thaddeus, before the river God and before the sun God, in, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made by him. And without him was anything made out. But in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness. How can you start a story like this? He says before Mary. He made no reference to Mary. He made no reference to Elizabeth. It's not important. He is telling you that the ancient of days, the one who created the world, all things were made by him. And without him was anything made that was made. In him was life. He is life himself. His emphasis was not the birth, the in, the manger. It was not important. He says that sometimes we are deceived to think that he is one of us just because he's born in a manger, just because he was born to a teenager called Mary and a man called Joseph who was a carpenter. You forget that this is the word made flesh and tabernacled among us. And he says to you, the Greeks, and you know the gods and you believe in the supernatural. But let me tell you the supernatural of the supernatural. The word, the ancients of days, tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. As of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He said, this is not one of the gods. Uh, they said uh, Zeus had had a child with a woman and uh, he forms what Hercules and all that. All those, those funny stories. This is not one of the Anansi stories. We saw him. We saw his light. We saw where eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there when the, uh, such a voice came from above that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The ancient of days, the divine God, the almighty God, tabernacled among us as flesh. So the emphasis of John was the fact that the ancient of days has found residence among men. Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Yesterday I was watching a sermon that changed me, that changed my perspective. The wisdom of Emmanuel, God with us. From the fall of man in the Garden Eden, man has always looked for God when man was driven out of the presence of God in Eden and and, and there was no place found for him. You know, when you look at Eden, Eden was God with earth. I don't know whether you are getting me. Eden was a dimension of heaven on earth. So God created a garden and planted it at the east. So that garden mirrored the presence of God, mirrored everything that God was. So God was not detached from his creation. So God created the heavens and the earth. But God created a portal on earth called Eden and put man in there and said, subdue the earth, multiply, so that you can fill the earth with Emmanuel, which was captured only at Eden at the time. That's how come we can't find Eden. Because Eden was taken up when man fell. That presence was lost when man disobeyed. 
It was the mirrored presence of God and the dimensions of God that he brought on earth so that man can be with God through Eden, which was God with us. So God was with the earth he created through Eden. I don't know whether you are getting me. But when man fell and was driven out of the, 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 the garden, there was no presence of God with man anymore. So that word that God wanted to be with his creation was lost. Then we have the man called Enoch. Then we have the patriarchs, all the, the great people that God used. God wanted to destroy the earth and God, you know, Noah, all these great people, Enoch walked with God and was not. But those were patches of God's presence on earth. I don't know whether you are getting me. So God will reveal himself to an individual somewhere in Canaan, somewhere in Saudi Arabia, somewhere in Israel, somewhere in Ghana, Kolungo, individuals were seeing God. Somehow, Enoch saw God, so it was written. He walked with God, he was not. Noah also walked with God. He was a preacher of righteousness. Somehow he obeyed God, saved his generation. Then we come to Abraham. One of the things that Abraham did was that anywhere he encountered God, he built an altar. And that altar was supposed to be a remembrance to his children and his children's children that this place is where I met God. If you want to meet God, this is where you are likely to meet him. That was the point of the altars. Where, so he littered the wilderness with altars. Wherever he had encounters, what did he do? He built an altar. An altar was a stone. So the stone is arranged in such a way that it is not easily displayed. It was not just the animals that were put on the stone and sacrificed that made the altar. It was the stone. The stone signified permanence. It signified this is where... So some of you those days, when you go and steal money, from your parents and you don't want to be caught you go and buy the money somewhere in the ground and put a stone on it so that when you come back you can see where you hid the thing but you know if you make a mistake and it rains and the rain moves the stone you go search tire uh, you go search tire you will not see so stones represented locations so when you see an altar being built to God by Abraham it was just to show this is the location that Elohim appeared at so if you are looking for Elohim he is likely to be here. But you see, God is not a stagnant God. God is a moving God. So yes, God appeared at those places and altars were built at those places. But beyond the altars, God wanted to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God tabernacled among us. So his son Jacob, Abraham's great-grandson, or no, grandson, so Isaac, then Jacob. Grandson was running away from his brother after stealing his blessing. In fact, he did not steal the blessing. He negotiated for it. Because he already made an arrangement his brother that if you give me this lentil, this bowl of lentils, you will give me your birthright. So he did not steal it when his father was about to die. He negotiated it about 20 years even before Isaac died. So he was running away because his brother wanted to kill him. And then he saw one of the altars that his grandfather, Abraham, had built in the wilderness. And he slept on one of the stones. The Bible said in the night, the heavens opened. Ah, hallelujah. And angels were ascending and descending. And he said, this is the house of God. The God was here and I did not know it. So there, there was an Emmanuel in that wilderness. God with us. So God somehow saved him. And so when he was going, there was Bethel. When he was coming, there was Peniel. It was, he had an encounter, two encounters. One running away from his brother. The second one on his way coming from his uncle Laban. He encountered God again. In that same wilderness, on those same rocks, which were altars that his grandfather Abraham had built after encountering God. I pray for you. Today, there, there won't be stones in the wilderness, but you will chronicle your encounters with God. There will be enough evidence of the reality of God that you can say that I did this and I met God. Somehow on my way, on my journey, in my 30 years of life, I met God here and I met God there and I met God here and God spoke here. You cannot live your life without any altars. The altars are not physical stones. Are your encounters with God? Where are they? Ask your neighbor, where are they? That is the evidence of Emmanuel which is God is with you. God has spoken. God has encountered man. God has transformed man. God has delivered man. Then through Abraham, different, different things had happened until Mary. God had appeared in different forms. But you see, God was appearing in places. But in Jesus Christ, he appeared like one of us. He came and tabernacle among us, like us. 
God with us. God living with us. There is an evidence, there is a tangibility to his coming. And that's the Emmanuel. And I, and I pray for you that what was abstract became concrete. There are many things you know about God, but they are abstract knowledge. You know about the power of prayer, but it's abstract. Like prayer is powerful. Like there is some power in prayer. Be, you know, but it has never been concrete. When we say the word, which was intangible, became flesh, it means that... <laughs> The things that you knew and heard about God can become concrete. Divine encounters can be concrete. The power of God can be concrete in your life. The prophetic words can be made flesh. Miracles can happen. And it's my prayer for you that Emmanuel, which was the God that we used to talk about, that he's in heaven somewhere, is lying right among us. We can see him. He said that we, for that which our hands have handled, we have touched it. I pray that in this season, just like Mary held in her hands the ancient of days, you would hold something ancient in your hand. Your life would have a physical evidence of something so abstract, something that people have talked about generations before you have talked about divine prosperity, but somehow in this generation may we handle it. We've talked about the power of God. We've preached about the power, but may we handle the power. John said that that which we have handled, our hands have handled. We have looked upon it. We have seen it. We've heard it, but we have now handled it concerning the word of life, that the life was manifested to us and we saw it we were eyewitnesses of his majesty Emmanuel means that things can be tangible they can be practical they can be touched they can be felt they can be heard I pray that whatever used to be abstract about God whatever used to be intangible about God would become tangible your hands can handle it your hands can touch it your eyes will see it may your eyes see something in this season may your ears hear something in this season in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God, tabernacle among us. I want to give two reasons why it was important to remind ourselves about the birth of Christ. And that would be from the book of John chapter 10 verse 10. And he says that the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. The reason why he came, the reason why he came, the reason why he came, the reason why he was born is that we may have life. The, the purpose of his birth is for that life. So we are reminding ourselves that there is a life you are supposed to be living. There is a life that he came that you might have. Ferdinand, there is a life that he came. I came that they may have life. Where is that life? The people were already alive when he came. So what was he talking about, Pastor Bright? There were already people who were accomplishing great things. People were marrying. People were having children. Generations before Jesus came. So what was Jesus talking about? That I came that they may have life. Which life again? People were already alive. I come to submit to you this morning that if the only life you are living was the one that they were living before Jesus came, you have wasted his coming. Because people were already alive. People were accomplishing great things. There were already scientific discoveries before Jesus came. People were smart. People were building boats. Even at the time of Noah, they were building boats. People were building equipment. David and Co. built a temple. The architecture was at his peak. Solomon's temple was built with gold. They were already mining gold. It's not like he didn't come to so that we do Galamse. We already had the wisdom to, to do Galamse and to build houses and to build palaces. Look at Solomon's table. The Bible said that, listen, he, the thousand bulls were, 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 were sacrificed for, for dinner, like we are going to have dinner. You even, you go and buy one tie. One chicken, the tie for the whole family. Solomon sacrificed thousand bulls for dinner. So people were already living large. Solomon was living in a paneled house. He was living in a palace. So which life did he come that we may have? The season of Christmas means that there is a life. 
There is a life that you are reminded that if you are not living in, you should start living in. There is a life. A life of victory over sin. A life of victory over sin. Men had all things but victory over sin. Somehow, sin dominated man. Sin had dominion over man. Weaknesses, secret weaknesses. They had a, so, there, there is a life above sin. And in this season of Christmas, beyond your celebrations and the joy and the chilling and the party and the, and the lights and the gifts and all that, remember there is a life that he came that you might have. If the only thing we do is the celebration without the reality of that life, we've wasted it. But I pray for you that in this season of Christmas, the life of the supernatural that he came that we may have, you truly have it. A life of encounters with God. A life of direction. A life of purpose. Knowing the purpose for your life. Knowing the direction God is leading you. Knowing, knowing where God is leading you to is crucial. And it is this occasion that we used to remind ourselves that Ferdinand, there is a life beyond human life. There is a life beyond the weaknesses of this life. Do you know that the life in a pig is not the life in man? The life in a fowl is not the life in man. Their life doesn't give them the technology to speak. There are different kinds of life. Do you know the plants are alive, but they can't walk? The animals are alive, they can walk, but they can't talk. Humans are alive, they can walk, they can talk, they can live, they can create, they can all. So you realize that although all there are living things and there are many living things we have in this world, the life in them has grades. They are great to read. The plant, the, the, the life in that plant, it's alive. Oh. You only know it's alive when you cut it. When you cut it, then you realize it dies. And you know that it was life that was in it. But that life doesn't give it an ability to cure illnesses, an ability to build cities, an ability to build cars, aeroplanes. You know, that, that life doesn't give a monkey the ability to build an aeroplane. They don't have the wisdom. The birds don't have the wisdom to make a keyboard and to play the keyboard and to make a microphone and a camera and to build houses and build mansions and all that. They don't have, their life in them doesn't permit that. So you realize that the software permits the things that can be done on the computer. The software is the life of the computer. I don't know whether you are getting it. Without it, the computer cannot function. So there is a life that permits miracles. There is a life that permits encounters. There is a life that permits, permits God invading man. There is a life of direction. There is a life of purpose. And it is that life that he came that you may have. So yes, we have human life that makes us move, that makes us talk, that makes us communicate. But there is also the divine life, which we are reminded of that at his birth, life came into the world. That life was introduced into the world at his birth. I pray for you that you will benefit from that life. I pray for you that you will benefit from that life. You would experience it. You will be a partaker of that life. You will partake of it in the name of Jesus. The second thing I want to talk about is 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It says that he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. In other words, this was why he was born. For this purpose, he was manifested. For this purpose, he was born. That he might destroy the works of the devil. The purpose is that the works of the devil will be destroyed. So Christmas is a waste of your time if the devil's works are still thriving. If the work of the devil is ripe in our families, in our lives, in our academics, in our world, in our cities, then we have wasted the reason why he was manifested. Because the sole agenda of his manifestation or his birth is to destroy the works of the devil. When you see corruption, when you see death, when you see sickness, when you see disease, when you see sin, those are the works of the devil. And that's what he came to destroy. So today I prophesy over your life that the works of the devil will be destroyed in your life in the name of Jesus. The secret works of the devil will be destroyed in your life in the name of Jesus. All forms of sicknesses, physical sicknesses, emotional sicknesses, mental health challenges, spiritual sicknesses. When Jesus met the madman of Gadara, 
the man had the legion of demons that made him stay in the tombs. This was a living person living among the dead. Living where dead people are. The Bible said that he cuts himself with stones and he binds himself. You know, some of you are doing things that destroy yourself. Like you are cutting yourself. The Bible said he was cutting himself and crying. Your decisions are hurting you. Your decisions. The one you've chosen to fall in love with. Oh, I'll preach the same one this morning. I don't know. I don't know what you're expecting, but I'll preach. Your own choices. Like that madman in Gadara. He's cutting himself and he's shouting because he's in pain. But he doesn't seem to have any control over inflicting pain on himself. How many people have been in something that you are not proud of but you didn't seem to have power to stop it? Yes, all of us. And those who didn't raise their hand, it didn't mean they are not struggling. Just, just look at them and, and move on. Hallelujah. You, you can feel bad about sin and still be in it. That's how sin is. That man was a picture of what sin did to man. Someone can be lying at the middle of the line. They are feeling bad, but they don't seem to have any control over it. You are destroying yourself. Somehow you only choose the foolish boys. Or somehow you only choose the girls that are not correct. How? How are your choices hurting you? Look at 2023. It would have been different if you made better choices. I'm telling you, you know how different your life could be? Some of you would have been millionaires right now if you had decided to do a certain business. Yes, it, it's an idea away. It's an idea away. If you had been nicer to someone, a door would have been opened. If you had prayed a prayer, if you had fasted, when you were supposed to fast, something would have happened. So this was this madman of Gadara inflicting pain on himself, destroying himself and crying, but didn't have any control over it. And Jesus said, I came to destroy the works of the devil. In the season of Christmas, it's not about a baby being born. It's about the works of the devil being destroyed. The works of the devil. The works of the devil. The works of the seed of the woman shall bruise thy head. When Jesus was born, that was the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman has come to bruise the head of the serpent. I pray that the head of the serpent will be bruised in your life. It will be bruised. It will not thrive. Some of you, the serpent is growing because there is enough food for it to eat. The serpent eats grass. It eats the ground. It eats soil. So whenever there is sin, it eats it. Jesus Christ said, the, the enemy comes and finds nothing in me. I pray that the, the works of the devil will not be thriving in your life. Some of us are now telling complex lies. You have now taken it a step further to, to doctor evidence to agree with your lies. You are not just lying. No. You are now making things align with the lies you are telling. Whatever form of sin and whatever shape or whatever works of the devil there are in our city, in our own lives, in our families, whatever the devil has destroyed, the devil has destroyed marriages, the devil has destroyed good relationships, the devil has destroyed good people, good people. I knew a guy, I like very sound guy. The last time I saw him was a drug addict. When we we're coming up in JHS, he showed a lot of promise. He was in a, he was in a very good family. His, had, his dad had his dad was a manager in one of the companies I knew. Big man. And he looked like, oh, these are the ones who will be the future. When you look at what the devil has done, it's the devil. Hey, hallelujah. It's the devil. And I pray that whatever works of the devil there are in your own life, in the lives of the people you love, whatever works of the devil in the marriage of your parents, the marriage of your... Like, see, see you, you don't know what the devil has done or, or the devil can do until he does it. Beautiful things can end in premium tears. There are people who don't want to see their faces anymore. Yes. But they started out saying that you are my life. You are the air that I breathe. You are my life. Singing songs and psalms and spiritual songs. When the devil is done, you don't want to see each other's face. But I pray for you that that, that manifested presence of God through the birth of Jesus would destroy any works of the devil in your life in the name of Jesus.
But one day Jesus Christ walked into the temple and saw a woman who was bent for 36 years. And he said, Woman, that are, thou art loose from thy infirmity. There was a woman who had the spirit of infirmity. You see, medically, we would have found a diagnosis for her. If you know the effects of the works of the devil, eh, many of them you have physical explanations for. The man who was born blind would have said, Oh, congenital blindness, and you have differential diagnosis. Yes. But for every physical problem, there is a spiritual dimension. Even if it is from your mistakes, even if it's from your faults, there is a spiritual dimension to everything you see on this earth. The last scripture I want to share with you before I take my seat is Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. And he said that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has stood. The season of Christmas is a season of light. The light of God shining in the darkness of this world. May the darkness that has found its way into your life give way to the light that shone during Christmas. You didn't hear what I'm saying. Men were living in darkness. The Bible said that those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. May your life see light. Oh, you didn't hear me. A life of light is a light of promotion. It's a life of promotion. It's a life of advancement because life moves fast. When we look at light, we are looking at advancement. We are looking at progress. May that great light that shone over 2,000 years ago by his birth, may that same light shine in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be on your feet with me. Be on your feet with me. Those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Those who sat in darkness. Were you clapping? If you are clapping, do a better one unto Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give it up unto Jesus. Let's give it up unto Jesus. Those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. So, I want you to pray. I know we've prayed already, but in this season of Christmas, we want to pray that the light of God will shine on my life. The Bible said, Arise, shine, for thy light has come. Whenever light comes, you arise and you shine. Whenever light comes, you arise. Whatever makes you go backward, whatever makes you sit down, whatever makes you faint, in the name of Jesus, arise and shine, for thy light has come. Those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. On the occasion of his birth, a great light shone upon this earth. You want to pray in the name of Jesus that my life will see the light. My life will see the light in the name of Jesus. My life will see the light in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration. Thank you for... Your birth brought life to us. Your birth brought light to us. Your birth destroyed the works of the devil. We pray that the works of the devil are perpetually destroyed among us. May our lives never be the same again. As we remember this day, may the encounters from above, may the opening of the realms, may the visitation of heaven, may we partake of the realities of it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your great sacrifice to your birth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for listening to the sermons of Reverend Dr. Albert Agbi. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Edify Church Life. Listen to more of his sermons on our Telegram at Edify Sermons and Edify Church Spotify platforms. Thanks for being a part of our Edify Church family. Be blessed by this word of God.